Hello everyone, welcome to Team Yume Gaming Podcast, in which we shall discuss a game we both played, while the footage from said game is going to be shown while we are talking. It's a new concept that I just come up with, and I say, let's give it a try and see where this leads us. So, what game shall we review in tonight, Devar? This, this past month, I, me, both me and Madhog have been playing Freedom Planet. Freedom Planet! And just so everyone knows, it's the PC version, PC version as of right now, as the Wii version has, will be coming out soon. Well, the Wii oh. U version. Oh, the, oh, oh, there's going to be a Wii U version, I did not know that. Yes, they'll be coming out somewhere in this month in August at some point, I heard. Anyway, yes, Freedom Planet is a Sonic the Hedgehog-inspired, side-scrolling 2D action platformer, and it's glorious. At least that's my opinion of it. What do you think, Devar? Pretty much echoing the same thing here. Pretty glorious so, platforming so, uh, there. So, the question is, uh, best game or bestest game? <laughs> I, think, I think it needs to be a bit more awesome game. <laughs> okay, so awesome game or awesomest game? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's just say awesome in the Saturday morning cartoon kind of awesome. <laughs> well, I dare say this in that context, this might very well be Sonic Set AM on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is that good, in my opinion. If you recall, we originally reviewed the demo for this game. Which was uh, in a Let's Play format. <laughs> we we yes. did that. Yes, it was basically an excuse to have one of our hey, most on. intellectually fulfilling discussions about video games we ever had, and probably will ever have ever again, <laughs> <laughs> at this rate. We discussed about uh, gaming templates, or the idea of classic video games made by the older game developers that shaped the industry as we know it, serving as the uh, groundwork for new indie developers, serving as the basis for new developers to build their own games inspired by such classics to begin with. And this is pretty much a spot-on textbook example of such gaming template, which is a Freedom Planet, it is. Again, as we said, it's a Sonic-inspired game, and it really shows every step of the way that it's Sonic-inspired. In fact, it was supposed to be a Sonic fun game at the beginning, but then they decided to make their own game out of it, out of this pre-existing template. Yes. And that was good for them, because honestly, I'm going to be blunt from minute one on this podcast, even though uh, it's been a fair few minutes already. Yeah. I think Freedom Planet accomplishes something that even the original so-called good Sonic games couldn't accomplish. It's a, a complete gameplay experience that far surpasses and far exceeds anything that any of the actual official Sonic games that were the inspiration for this could ever accomplish. And I know it's a really bold statement, but it's not coming out of nowhere. Well, yeah, it's definitely not coming out of nowhere, that's for sure, considering the the years that Sonic has been going on for. Not to mention, uh, when you play Freedom Planet, it's a lot more different in feel to the Sonic games, that's for oh, sure. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, this isn't just Sonic with a spin, <laughs> pun very much intended. I wish I was the one who came up with this uh, obvious pun, but I wasn't, sadly. <laughs> it was somebody on the Escapist magazine, but anyway, regardless. The great thing about Freedom Planet is that it, it doesn't just take the basic template from the classic uh, Sega Genesis or Sega Mega Drive, if you live in Europe, Sonic the Hedgehog video games, uh, the way the levels are conceived and the way the characters are designed, and the fastness, so to speak, and it doesn't just build upon that basis, adding new things that enrich the uh, gaming experience as a whole, but I dare say it even fixes some of the basic problems that the original Sonic games had always had. And I'm going to expand on that right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Trying because... to do a post <laughs> for dramatic effect. This, this needs a sequitur pretty much immediately because, it, again, it's a really controversial statement. 
So, dun, 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 dun. Okay, I'm letting the whomever is listening to this boil in rage for a few, for a few seconds <laughs> for my own uh, private amusement. <laughs> of course you would, because All right, so, it wouldn't be you without that. Yes. All right, so I have played the original Sonic games. Um, even though I did not grow up with Sonic, I played them all. So I know what I'm saying when I say that there was a dissonance in between what the game encourages you to play as and what the actual levels in said game would actually force you to play. What I'm saying is that Sonic is a fast character. He's gonna go fast, gonna go fast. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, no. What, 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 what was it? What was it that Genesis used to say about uh, the fastness? Something, something. Blast processing. Blast processing. Yeah, extreme nineties blast you, processing. But really, if you play the Sonic games properly, really, then you would realize the levels designs are based around. You can run a bit for adrenaline, but oh, you gotta stop here and do some platforming. Oh, and here's some more running. Oh, wait, there's another platforming section. Don't forget the obstacles and the many enemies you are, you inevitably run into, losing all your rings. Yeah, and not to mention if you bump, you know, especially you can't react to them fast enough. Yes, and that's the problem with the actual original Sonic games. They are good games, and they are important games. Oh, yeah, they're, they, they're very, they, they are good games in their own right. Yeah. But, but they had this small flaw in the level design that kind of puts the whole Sonic race into perspective, because we have a fast character, but we have levels that do not fully accommodate a fast character. And the side-scrolling 2D point of view doesn't help his case, because you cannot see the obstacles coming when you're running that fast. And the game itself encourages you to play this fast, because the speed was the main selling point of the whole series. In fact, you could argue that Sonic would work better in a 3D environment in which you can actually see the obstacles coming a mile apart and you can actually be prepared to avoid them. But again, uh, <laughs> the first time they actually tried to do some 3D magic with Sonic, uh. they, they either didn't know what they were doing or the technology did not allow for the levels themselves to keep up with the ridiculous speed of the Hedgehog, which was kind of a problem with Sonic Adventure, and, and it was a continued problem throughout most of the Sonic 3D games. In fact, since we are on this line of thought, I dare say that the best design Sonic levels were in Sonic Unleashed, and only when those levels didn't occasionally revert into 2D side-scrolling platform, which again, it would completely kill the momentum of your speed. But when it was running in those 3D levels, you could actually avoid obstacles while keep running and never losing your momentum. Again, levels that would actually accommodate a fast character. Levels made for a fast character. Levels built around a fast character. And not the other way around. So, it's too bad that the rest of that game of Sonic Unleashed wasn't really all that good. No, <laughs> to it put wasn't. It like so, yes, if you could have a Sonic game comprised of those levels, it would be the greatest Sonic game ever. Yeah. But now, back to Freedom Planet. Here's what they do right, fixing those uh, original flaws in the original design of the Sonic levels. First of all, they are very reminiscent of all the classic stages in the classic games. That's for sure, but they are different enough in their approach and in their design that it feels like you're playing a unique. game that has a sense of creativity, of uniqueness to it. Yes, that a makes unique it experience, I would say. Yes, that makes it very distinguishable from any other game. Like I said, the main focus of the original Sonic the Hedgehog games was speed. Going, gotta go fast, gotta go fast, etc. Which clashes with what you can actually do in those levels, but anyway, regardless. Speed in Freedom Planet is not the main focus, it is one of the main focuses. The other will be fast pace, close quarters combat. There is a heavy emphasis on combat, in fact, which makes for a lot of variety. But when you run around in this level, because you will have to run around some of these times, 
run around or even flying around, depending on which character you're playing as, because each character has its own different mm. gameplay style you have to readapt all over again. Yeah, and unique abilities as well. Yes, unique abilities, of course, unique talents and abilities, which are actually linked to the type of characters they are supposed to be, which is great, because another thing that the original Sonic games never had was, well, actual characters. <laughs> For once, actual well-developed characters yes. with, a, with a story. <laughs> we'll get to that. But anyway, okay, when you're running in these levels, it never feels like the game is forcibly killing your momentum. It always feels like you are choosing to stop your speed momentum because you either want to deal with an enemy or you want to explore a level. Either way, it feels like you are deciding the pace of the game you're playing and not the other way around. And that's something that makes a world of difference when you're experiencing this type of action side-scrolling platformer game. So somehow they fixed that and uh, not only did they add on the original basis, on the original template, but they improved it immensely. And that's why I say that Freedom Planet is a much more satisfying experience, gaming experience, to me, personally, than all those classic Genesis games. <laughs> I'm probably, probably going to have to join you on that ship there, Madhog, because I have that same <laughs> oh, feeling. Oh, oh no, no, please, do, do not dare join my ship, because you are you will ruin all my ships, as always. <laughs> you're, always you're a ship ruiner. You oh, ruin come all on. The ships. I'm, yes, I'm, yes, I'm <laughs> still mad at you for that time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I, I mean, I want to join you on this Freedom Planet ship. <laughs> You know, to say how good the game is and how much I, I have a more fond and joyful time with it more than any Sonic game I've ever played. Yes, uh, exactly what I just said. I know, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying I'm echoing that feeling just because I just feel it in my heart when I actually play it. I mean, I don't know how to explain it, but I can just feel it if you know what I mean. Yes, I know what you mean. I uh, feel you, man. <laughs> okay, this game is really enjoyable, but also really challenging. Challenging, sometimes really hard, sometimes <laughs> insanely hard, we'll get to that, but it's really fair. Usually really fair in its harding, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those games where you have to learn things by trial and error. Yes, Especially uh, a, lo against a, lot, bosses. a lot of errors. I, I dare say a lot of errors in but my case. I don't know about you, but... Let's put it this way. I died about, uh, let's see, with Lilac about... 35 times in one playthrough because I was wow. trying to come up with I was trying to figure out each of the bosses Thir uh, 35 times the bar. Yeah, I think it was 35 or oh, I thought it was 25 Well, uh, that's good for you. I died 100 times. Oh my gosh Yes, okay. Let me put it this way. The final boss wrecked me <laughs> wrecked me with five R's. <laughs> okay, to be fair, this is not the the usual type of games I usually play, but nevertheless, holy mother of space god, that was balls to the wall insanely hard. And yeah, <laughs> but but this but once I but once I managed to beat it, once I managed to complete this game as Lilac. It was one of the most satisfying experiences of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I felt the same. It just felt you were full of elation whenever you beat a boss. It you're was, like, you're like okay. yes, I beat that boss finally. And it feels like that because this game has an actual story delivered via cutscenes. Very lengthy cutscenes, I not, might add, not, in between. <laughs> not Metal Gear but, Solid length, but... No, uh, actually, these cutscenes had something interesting going on, unlike Metal Gear Solid, <laughs> the entirety. Yeah, ex in fact, Metal Gear Solid is exposition the cutscenes. Exposition the cutscenes. <laughs> or cutscene the exposition. <laughs> and uh, also pointless philosophical debacles that don't go really anywhere other than to stroke Hideo Kojima's ego. Further and, and further, but anyway, and Freedom his Planet. And love for movies, yes. <laughs> yes, Freedom Planet has cutscenes, lengthy cutscenes that explain uh, an interesting plot, a, a fairly simple and straightforward one, but nonetheless, something interesting enough to keep you going and makes you emotionally invested in the story and the characters. So, when you actually beat the final bad guy, Lord Brevon, which is 
this robot mantis kind of man, who apparently ripped Eggman's mustache from his face and, and put, put it on his head for eyebrows. As, as, as giant eyebrows, but regardless, he's actually pretty intimidating. Oh yeah, I, when I, you actually I, I, would like, I would like to say as well that the voice actor for, for Brevin does a fantastic job as him. Uh, all the voice actors were pretty good. Oh yeah, oh, they're all fantastic. But yes, Brev this game. But this, yes, this game is fully voice acted, by the way. <laughs> yeah, all the voice actors do a fantastic job as their characters. They match their personalities, and they have some decent lines that they can have fun with. Yes. And and <laughs> Brevin takes it away from me just because he has the right thing that villains need, and that's presence. Oh, he is presence and charismatic, but also, what I really find refreshing about this guy as a villain is that he doesn't really add any evil plan for the planet he ended up in. He, it just, just so happened just to so, be yes, there. He just so happened to crash land there because he was chased by the space police, or whatever you want to call them, the chasers. <laughs> so he decided he wants to go away from this planet, and to do so, he's willing to invade a city, kill the king, brainwash the sun, and throwing the entire planet into a war over energetic resources just so that he could get one item that he needs to just leave, to just have his ship restart. And that really tells volumes about what this guy is willing to do for what is essentially a mild annoyance to him. What just counts as a mild annoyance to him is a world crisis for everyone else in this story, and that's really, that makes for a fantastic villain. <laughs> so when you actually get to beat him at the end, because spoiler alert, the good guys win. Oh the yes, guys, that's, that's, the bad guys lose. Good guys win, and the bad guys lose. But anyway, when the good, when the good guys win, it's especially satisfying because you haven't just defeated a final boss from a from any game. You defeated the biggest douchebag in the universe, and it was so satisfying when you actually get to do that. Yes, it, it was very satisfying. It was well when when it comes to that. I have to admit. <laughs> yes. So, now, before we say that this game is the best game ever made, <laughs> let's actually go over the characters. The main characters, that is. Because yeah. uh, that's where that's where really your enjoyment of the game will fundamentally be, de be determined by. Which, by the way, spoiler alert, is really enjoyable, each one of them, in their own right. In their own right, but um, you should definitely start the game playing as the main character, Lilac, because it, it is the most balanced and uh, from a difficulty standpoint, it is the most balanced, and the curve is linear. So you start off easy, and it progressively becomes more and more difficult, up until it just gets insanely hard, as we said before. Yeah. You, want to, you want to start with a, with a precise difficulty curve. When you play as the other characters, either the difficulty curve becomes a, uh, a series of mountain tops, so to speak, <laughs> or in the specific case of Mila, uh, just a, a steep. <laughs> a really dangerous steep. With a big boulder that might come crashing to you. Yes, because with her, in her specific case, the gameplay changes so radically compared to the other two, which fits the character pretty well, because while Lilac and Carol, which are the two characters you can actually play the adventure mode, as in the story with, yeah, uh, they have... Very unique moves and talents and abilities that puts them either at a specific advantage or disadvantage depending on which enemy you're facing or which scenario you're in. They are both specialized in close quarters combat because they are both martial artist specialists, which is established with their own specific backstory. So again, uh, gameplay determined by the specific characterization of a character. That's uh, that's good, that's great. That's great game design, you guys. Yeah. Uh, but Mila, Mila, on the other hand, which is actually a Basset Hound, a, yeah. basically a puppy, she's basically Clonoa. <laughs> uh, I thought she was a cow bit, but no, she's uh, supposed to be a Basset Hound. Uh, with Mila, uh, she's not much of a fighter, but apparently she has inexplicable magic powers that allows her to generate a shield, and this bugs me because since she does not have an adventure mode, as in a story mode for her own in this game, and this is one of the problems that I have with this game, by the way, yeah, we do not get to understand where did she 
get these powers from because no one else seems to have them so it, they just come out of nowhere yeah i'll get to that in a few moments but uh uh but yeah mila's powers is basically is that she can shoot a laser and uh, create a block she can use a shield and if you use if you create a block first and then the press the button to shoot a laser a super laser Yes, uh, I learned to do that in the hardest way possible. <laughs> Let's just say that Mila and Prince Dale riding a giant robotic peacock don't really see high to high. Hey, uh, yes. I'm going to get back with that particular boss fight when I'm going to talk about Carol because it is a major point of contention to me. <laughs> yeah. But first, uh, we should probably talk, start with Lilac and talking about her, shouldn't we? Though? All right, Lilac is a dragon. Good luck finding that out if you don't <laughs> if you were playing the demo, because <laughs> she doesn't look anything like a dragon to me. So we were a bit confused about what her animal race was supposed to be when we played the demo the first time. Yeah, random bit of random bit of trivia from research on on the character designs. Uh, uh, when the creator wanted to make his n a new game, he actually tried to design his own characters, but ended up uh, not being able to do that. So he went and asked an artist by who goes by the name of Zio Ling and asked for her uh, permission to use her characters, and uh, was able to use them. Originally, Lilac was a hedgehog, but was turned yes, to a dragon. I can see why she would have been a hedgehog to begin with. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can definitely see that. But Carol... I, can definitely, I can definitely see her design resembling Amy Rose a little bit. Yeah, but uh, Carol and Mila are pretty much untouched except for clothes designs. Yeah. Th that was the only thing. That's a bit of trivia on that. So anyway, part. Carol Carol being the main character, of, of course, she is the fast one. Yeah, but, well, I like uh, fast. <laughs> like, she's gonna go fast, but actually, you know... Uh, when we played the demo, I actually decided to, to speculate about what kind of characters these playable characters were going to have, based solely on their uh, movesets and their appearances. I determined that Lilac was going to be the headstrong leader type that would actually go right head-on into danger just to save lives. She's exactly like that, in fact. And also all about doing the right thing. Yes. But, unlike Sonic, and Sonic the Hedgehog, she is not entirely stupid. <laughs> so, yeah. sorry, no, she has brains. She knows what she's doing, she has experience fighting, she cares for her friends, and she is smart, for the most part. So, that's nice. That that's girl does, does follow her heart a bit much, though, doesn't yeah, she? Well, it's which, is, which is very nice, though. And uh, she puts herself in the front line to protect her friends. Basically, of course, this usually translates in Carol, which is her best friends and childhood friend, and they have been together for quite some time. I understand. This usually ends up in Carol having to actually uh, barge in with her unbelievable motorcycle that defies the laws of physics to save her from danger. <laughs> the most awesomest motorcycle rider ever. <laughs> yes, that motorcycle is the most ridiculously. How did she put on those? How did she okay. put on those wheels? <laughs> okay, that motorcycle can climb walls. Apparently, it can do a double jump that turns into a spin attack, and it pretty much can thread on everything and everyone. Yes. And yet, three hits and it's destroyed. That's yes. Bit... Instant disappointment every time you lose that damn motorcycle. Yes, the motorcycle is both the coolest thing about Carol's own playthrough, but sadly it's also the most gimmicky, because you don't really need it to beat the game. Nope. Well, except when the game actually forces you to use it, which was for only two boss fights, but regardless, uh, it's really memorable. It, it's, it's one of the most memorable things about this character. I like her character too. Um, in the demo that yeah. we played, I surmised that, her, that she was going to be the youngest of the group. I was right about that. She's definitely younger than Lilac. Yep. And she was going to be mostly a 
angry teenager that has everything to prove to the world. It turns out she's the opposite of that. She's a cool-headed, possibly a bit childish uh, teenager that acts like she's got nothing to prove. She is Rainbow Dash, feline version. Not to mention she is in very fact, confident and, uh, well, yes. and let's see, what's the word I'm thinking of? She has dialogue braggart. that makes her uh, slightly she's fun. A bit, she's a bit of a braggart. <laughs> because also, there... okay, also, speaking of speaking of Rainbow Dash, you know, every time the voice actress for Carol says, Oh yeah! She sounds exactly like... <laughs> yeah, she definitely... Ashley, like, like freaking Ashley Ball doing Rainbow Dash. Yeah. Oh yeah, 20% cooler, 10 seconds flat. Oh I got yeah, a I got that's a... my girl. I got a motorcycle. Oh yeah! <laughs> now we're talking. This is Team Carol. We'll discuss the name later. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, 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 a... <laughs> that little joke about the... Uh, about the fad that ended up on DeviantArt about teams. <laughs> oh well, that was well, a nice little jab at that. Yes, I think I'm aware of that. <laughs> Lilac is often the most childish. You of mean the Carol? Two. Because you said Lilac. I often confuse the two of them. <laughs> so I often confuse the names. I don't know why. Carol is usually the more childish of the two, but when it comes to to fighting and uh, danger, she tends to be the most mature about it. And uh, in fact, most of the times she tends to say. Don't go into danger, Lilac. Don't be a hero for once. Let's just lay back, relax, have a fun time. I Let's... want to be with my best friends, damn it. I don't want to fight evil all the time, which is understandable. <laughs> yeah. But she ends up doing it anyway. And let's face it, she kind of enjoys it too. I mean, she gets to show off her cool fighting her, abilities and her, her mad wildcat, wildcat uh, martial artist skills. And I'd say she's actually the more skilled martial artist, except she cannot do a uppercut to save her life. Nope. <laughs> That's one of the problems that I have. Playing with Lilac, you can do a series of really interesting combos from every conceivable angle or direction, simply by moving the, not the analog stick and pressing the action button. And by the way, I use the game pod to yeah. play this game because I wouldn't be able to do it with a keyboard. And I'm I the I'm the rebel. I play with the keyboard. Well, good for you. I this, <laughs> For most people, this is clearly the kind of game you cannot play with a keyboard, but Davar is not most people. <laughs> really? I think that it's playable with a keyboard. I think it's near to impossible for me to play it properly with a keyboard, because I'm used to use the, the gamepad. I wouldn't be able to act fast enough had I had my moving keys <laughs> so far apart from... Uh, my action keys. Yeah, it's, I can uh, understand that though. The gamepad is probably the most recommended to play this sort of game, but I'm just going to say that play, keyboard is playable at least. Also, I would suggest to actually down the sensibility of the controls a little bit, up to 50%. That would be the best option <laughs> to play this game. Other than that, this game controls really well. Controls are precise and tight, and they respond fast. They have to, otherwise this game would be fundamentally broken. Yeah, it's, it, I have to admit, it's really fine-tuned for a game of this sort of indie developers. Uh, let's see, were we done talking about Carol, or do we... Oh, uh, we go on actually, to, we so go Lilac, about Lilac. Is a, Lilac is a dragon. Yeah. And uh, her own background is linked with the very history of the Freedom Planet, which, by the way, it's not actually literally named the Freedom Planet. It's called Avalis. Yeah. <laughs> I called it not Mobius. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish it was Mobius, actually. <laughs> anyway, Avalis. So, uh, okay, she has a spin, sort of a spin dash attack, which is actually far better than a spin dash attack. It's, it's a special move, by the way. She curls into a spinning ball, which makes her momentarily invincible for, for a half a second. And then, depending on which way you're facing the character, she can either use this move to fly towards some direction and reach uh, otherwise unreachable places, or she can just go faster on the uh, horizontal line that she's already running to. That's when she gets really fast, insanely fast. <laughs> but the game can still keep up with that. And also, it's also a great move to get rid of a, of a bunch of enemies that are neatly aligned in front of you, yeah. or to quickly reach a boss that's just, you know, flying above you and you cannot reach it with conventional means. 
that's our handy move to yeah. have. The other most handiest move she has is the when you double jump with her. She does oh, a nice little that. spin. It's a really, it looks, not only does it look very nice to look at, but it's also very effective in many, many, many places. Honestly, that move that she has, the double jump that turns into a spin attack, yeah. once you do the second jump, was a game changer <laughs> for her playthrough. That and the Sonic Spin Dash Dragon attack that I just described. Yeah, the Dragon Boost it's called, I believe. The, the, the Dragon Boost, thank you for that. But really, the, the double jump spin attack was a game changer. It's what made her playthrough the most uh, approachable for a beginner of this game. And I think it's good that way, it's designed that way. I think it is, but, it you... uh, su but su suppose you start the game with uh, Carol instead of Lilac. <laughs> God help you. <laughs> you should definitely start off with Carol, because... Ta you mean Lilac? Carol... <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't you... know why, I don't know why I confused them. Okay, Lilac the Dragon. You should definitely start the game playing uh, the adventure mode with Lilac the Dragon. Yeah, and you didn't. If you didn't play with a dragon first, what's wrong with you? Dragons are cool. <laughs> uh, she doesn't look anything like a dragon. She even has the wrong nose and the wrong tail. Yes, the wrong everything. <laughs> she just, well, the only she... thing that could be count as dragon-like is the long hair pieces. Yeah, no, I thought honestly, she either looks like a horned echidna or a goat. <laughs> yeah, but uh, okay, what? Let's see, not only did Lilac have an uppercut, but she also had a... Uh, if you jumped in the air with her and press attack and down, then you'll be able to do a... a let's see, a drop kick, I, I would call it. Yeah, okay, so let's face it, Carol is probably the most uh, balanced... Lilac. And... <laughs> right, Lilac is the most balanced and easiest character you get to grips with. I don't know! Lilac looks like a Carol to me. I can't help it. I cannot help it. I don't know. I, I, I was afraid of this. Okay, before before recording this, I, I always say to myself, please don't confuse Lilac with Carol and vice versa. And here I go, getting the names wrong every single time. <laughs> Yeah, <sighs> don't worry, I'm here to, uh, with the trampoline here to, uh, put, <laughs> to put you back into the in All the right, so, Lilac the Dragon is the most balanced character in this game, which makes her the most affable and uh, approachable to play the game with, but also kind of ruins the game for the remaining characters, because while with Lilac, as I said before, you have a this nice difficulty curve going on, with the other two... You have an alternating difficulty curve depending on, on the scenario or, or the boss fight. Yeah. That's at least my experience with this because that's at least the experience we both had because we decided to start the game with Lilac. Well, yeah, because you, you had to play with the main character first. <laughs> yeah. So here's Lilac, okay? She has a complete moveset. She's very proficient both in close quarters combat and, and distance attack with her spin dash and double jump, spin attack, etc, etc. And not to mention that because of the fact she has a, a wide variety of moves, you feel like as if every one of them flows into each one another easily somehow? Yes, it, there is a nice flow between the way you exchange moves and the way you switch from one specific attack to the other. There is a nice flow and you feel in control of our actions. Now with Carol... <laughs> now, if I have to summarize all of the problems that this game has, it would have to be with one name, and that name is Carol the Wildcat. Sorry, Carol. You have, a, you have an enjoyable personality, but... Yes, I really like Carol, but... Uh, many things about her are decisively questionable. For example, dark green, really? Her color scheme is this dark green, dominant dark green that clashes with every single background in the entire game. <laughs> uh, that's questionable character design. But you know what also is questionable? Having a green character on a green background. <laughs> and that unfortunately happens a lot with Carol, especially during cutscenes. We have this <laughs> green character and the background is just forest. It's <laughs> it's it's a terrible visual cue, really. 
Uh, and you know what else is wrong? Having more than one character green. In fact, they have two main characters. <laughs> yeah. Buffer and the alien Torque, which dresses up as a shell duck, by the way, being the same color, basically. That really damages the uniqueness factor of your characters, of your main characters, having them both of the same dominant color. Well, Brevin's green. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a third one, too! <laughs> but at least it's a different shade of green. But seriously, what's this obsession with green? Green is not a creative color. <laughs> no, it's not a really good color, if you ask me. Not a good choice, not a good primary choice for a character you're supposed to play with uh, from start to end. By the way, people, just so everyone's in the know, talk is like the non-playable main character that's in the game. He's basically what drives the story, because he's you know, on this planet to cheese after Lord Brevon, and he gets the help of the, of our main heroines. Yeah. And <laughs> Lilac does the job well. <laughs> Here's the problem with Carol. Uh, while Lilac has a full range of attack in every conceivable direction, both on, on land and on air, Let's Carol... put it this way, folks. Carol has a limited move set. She mostly tends to attack horizontally. In fact, let me tell you a bit of, a, of an anecdote. A bit of my personal experience with this particular character. So, I was fighting Prince Dale, riding his giant robotic peacock <laughs> at the end of the Sky Battalion level. And already I was having trouble with Carol because I was really frustrated by the fact that she could not do the double jump spin attack like Carol did. No, in on her fact, second jump, she jumps fact, forwards. Yes, uh, her second jump, she jumps forward, which is basically a death sentence with this particular boss. And since she, she does not have omnidirectional attack patterns, whenever I try to have her jump, and I would happen to push the... Uh, uh, the analog stick of my game pod slightly above uh, leftish or rightish on a general uh, high direction to ever jump high. You know what would actually happen in this case? What? What happens here? She freezes up and she looks up. <laughs> that honestly happened. The fun part is that that only happens with Carol. I never so had I that. I tried to have... because you were playing with a keyboard, probably. <laughs> I tried to have her jump above, and... And she freezes up. She looks up. She stands still like a sitting duck, and she looks up. So, bottom line is that I died 10 consecutive times fighting this boss with this character, while this very same boss, I could defeat it after three tries with Lilac. The problem is, is that you're so used to playing with Lilac and having that that double jump, so to speak, the spinning attack as well, which acts as a double jump, is that Carol's on uh, it's hers. A, it's, a double, it's a double jump that kills its own momentum, yeah. for once. And since she lacks an omnidirectional combat pattern in her moveset, she cannot actually properly do a move to defend herself from my above. She only attacks horizontally, basically. Yeah. Which is a problem with certain bosses, but... Actually, it turns out, surprisingly enough, to be particularly effective, her own fighting style, towards other bosses that were much harder for Lilac to deal with. Carol has this one special move, which is basically a, uh, a blurry floor session of uh, roundhouse kicks. Yeah, that's probably one yeah, of you know the... Yeah, it's like it's okay, that like, move. Okay, it's like Chun Li's going mad on you. Yes, she okay. She's got that Chun Li, yeah, martial artist uh, aerial kick thing going on here. Yeah, but when she does that, she's actually invincible. <laughs> As it turns out, using that move in this in very specific ways against very specific bosses gives you an edge in that fight. So bottom line is that while fighting. Prince Dale on a giant robotic peacock, and this still hasn't gotten old, saying this out loud. <laughs> she was a, an obvious disadvantage, because the guy was attacking from every direction, and Lilac was severely handicapped in her moveset. You mean Carol was handicapped in the moveset? Carol! Carol was severely handicapped <laughs> in her moveset, damn it! <laughs> 
instead, yeah. instead, when I was fighting Serpentine in his last form, at the end of uh, Final Dreadnought Round 2, I was actually able to defeat him much, much quicker than with Lilac. With Lilac, it took me many, many tries. I didn't count them, but they were many, many yeah. tries. Because while every boss in this game has a specific pattern that's that, that you can memorize and use to your advantage, the most difficult bosses also tend to be insanely fast. So you really, have to be on your game with those bosses. Oh, holy, sh oh, holy jumping Satan, I'd say. The Blu-ray uh, kick thing. Uh, we, need a, we need a name for that move. I forgot what it's called now, but I know I read it, what it's called. Uh, it's the Chun Li kick, basically. Yes, the That's the Chun -Li kicks kick. of Chun Li. So thanks to his Chun, to her Chun Li kick, Carol can be invincible for one whole second, and used at the right time, it can give damage to the enemy without you taking the right damage. Needless to say, I exploited that move to hell and back while fighting <laughs> the final boss. Oh, to be honest, that probably was the best one to use because. The only other move she could do was if it was a normal combos of claw attacks, and the yes. other one, which is basically a during the pounce attack when you jump twice and then she jumps towards an yes. enemy. Oh, by she, the way, you basically uh, press the attack button and does a powerful claw attack. Yes, but uh, that seems a bit overcomplicated, especially if you're going so fast and you you don't have time to think this through. Yeah, it's one reason why I didn't use that move that much, because it seemed like as if you really had to be, you know, straight and true for, yes. for that to actually land. Now, don't get me started on Mila. Every move, everything you do with Mila has to be deeply thought out, deeply well thought out due to her particular moveset. And most of the times you don't have the time to think things through. But anyway, about Carol. So, oh, 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 by the way, she can climb walls. Yeah, Carol can climb walls. You could just, just grab up on a wall and jump up it. Yes, that's uh, that's her own way to reach uh, difficult places. Only if you can reach them, though. Though I would you recommend know, the know. motorcycle. <laughs> yes, but anyway, the good thing about uh, Carol is that she can basically keep climbing forever to every single type of wall. Unlike Knuckles, who could only climb specific types of walls in the original Sonic games, which is very helpful many times. Okay, so speaking of Carol's uh, Chun-Li flurry kick... Yeah? You have no idea how much easier the final boss, the very final, final boss, was to fight against with that particular kick, because you know what? You yes, know what? Okay, I, I use that. Because, uh, because mild spoilers here, mild, very mild spoilers. When Lord Brevon, uh, in his final form, does his uh, sudden knife attack, he basically takes half of your health with it. It can really be difficult to evade if you don't learn the pattern of his movements yet. But with Carol, basically all you need to do is activate the chun -Li kick just at the right time where Lord Braven is uh, going for your neck. He takes loads of damage and you take none. <laughs> That's one way to exploit the final boss, which is, by the way, really difficult. I don't know if I emphasize this enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, just like just like a classic uh, platformer. <laughs> but uh, speaking of classic platformers, here's another thing that doesn't quite work with this game. The life system is completely pointless. <laughs> okay, that's a new one. Okay, so in true form of the classic Sonic games, the characters have a limited amount of lives to beat the game. But A, they have infinite continues. Okay? Yeah. And B, even if you do reach a game over and you continue the game, you don't even start from the beginning of the level, you start from the last checkpoint. Which means that the life system is completely... Useless. Mm. It's completely pointless. It's, it's just there as an homage to classic games, but there is really no point in A, collecting lives, or B, collecting gems to gather lives. Or indeed, all the things you usually do to collect lives in this sort of classically inspired games. Because, like I said, the checkpoint system 
is really, really generous, fair, and there are infinite continues, so there is really no point in having lives in this game to begin with. Yeah, I can see that now, now you put, now you pointed that out, because I just didn't really think about it that much, I just... I just thought... In fact, in fact, much to my absolute relief, uh, <laughs> the final boss has three rounds. Basically, even if you game over the game, you start from the last round you were in, which means you don't even get to fight the boss in its three stages all over again, you're just going to be fighting the boss in the stage he is now. Yeah, the one because that you left the, at. Exactly, because the checkpoint system and the infinite continues are that generous. And it's a great thing because, oh boy, the bosses in this game are far, far more difficult than any of the Sonic games bosses ever were. <laughs> it's like they really wanted to try so hard to see who could come up with the best way to avoid this attack, but yet it's like nearly impossible. That freaking spaceship that Lord Braven has is so cheap. <laughs> so you're, cheap. You're telling me. Gosh, oh, I hate man. that ship. Oh man. Yeah, I hate that ship. <laughs> that's why I That's, <laughs> that's why, why I ruined, ruined it. it. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's briefly address Mila. Oh yeah, Mila. Which, which is the one character we left out. Yes, and it's my personal favorite for of reasons. Course it is, of course it is. Of course it is. We establish why it is, you, <laughs> you low life. <laughs> we, we already discussed in the Let's Play of it, when we well, the showcase of it, that, the Mad, that Mad Hog thought that in the demo that she would be the shyest of, of, the, of them all, but it's not that well, too here's shy. The, uh, well, here's the thing. By the way she was introduced to both Lilac and Carol, you'd think she's Fluttershy. And I don't just mean the archetype that Fluttershy embodies in Friendship is Magic. No, I mean, that scene literally reminded me of when Twilight Sparkle, along with Spike the Dragon, first met Fluttershy. She was super timid and scared at first, but then she saw the cute dragon and she changed her demeanor completely. <laughs> the only difference is that in this case, the cute little dragon and the main character just happened to coincide. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that. Because and Mila wanted to so much see a dragon. Yes. And touch her hair. <laughs> uh, yeah, at that point, Carol makes the most appropriate face <laughs> to the situation. <laughs> she, she looks at the player in disgust. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. <laughs> I, I thought that scene was both cute and yet amusing all at once. You know what else is amusing about this game? Yeah. It has actual slice-of-life moments. Yeah, I've, I've definitely yes. seen those. So well. the, the cutscenes aren't just there to further the story, they're also there to develop the characters and their dynamic by adding slice-of-life moments. I mean, there is this scene in which all uh, Carol, Lilac and Mila are just sitting in their uh, treehouse and they're watching a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and talking uh, about stuff. And talking about space cooties. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know how young they're supposed to be, but I'm going to assume they are all teenagers. Well, Lilac is 15, Carol is 12, and Mila is 10. So it's exactly like Sonic characters. <laughs> Pretty I mean, much. Who said the world has to be saved by freaking 15 years old? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's ludicrous. <laughs> I know. It's like a tall order, isn't it? It's a tall order, and that's funny because they are th three feet tall. <laughs> best. Anyway. Uh, yeah, we were uh, talking about okay. space cooties. That was a thing that happened in that cutscene. I, I don't know how to feel about the cooties part, because that felt a bit... Uh, that's, that was really childish even for them. Yes, uh, it, it's, it's not only that, it seems like an outdated thing that children don't think about anymore. I don't believe for a second that Carol is 12 because she does not act like a 12 years old. No. At, at all. She rides a freaking motorcycle. She tends to be the more level-headed of the two when it comes to just headstrong heading into battle. So, if anything, you'd think she's at least 16. Yeah, you, you would know? think that. I, would, I thought that at first until I did my research. 
Anyway, your research. Yeah. Let's let's talk about Mila. Yeah, Mila, Mila. Like I said, she's timid, but she but once she gets to know someone, she really opens up to people. Oh, she's the exact opposite of timid. Once she gets over the first encounter, that's what I mean. She's, she's timid yes, at first. She is a cute. She is the cute and bubbly type, and she doesn't really. Uh, as far as characters go, she is the weakest. Yeah, the it a also bit. doesn't help for one thing. I will get to later with the story. Okay, the problem that I personally have with Mila yeah. is that she does not have her own adventure mode. Which sucks, because in if you play the classic mode of the game, which is basically all the levels, one after the other, but without the cutscene... You get no context. Without the context, without the story context, then you get... You're basically playing a classic Sonic game with no story, just continued levels, one after the other. If you play that, you can see immediately that she has her own personalized costume level that takes advantage of her own move. And by the way, yes, each character in their own game get their own personalized level. A level that only they could get through because they are specifically designed to accommodate their own specific talents and abilities. Otherwise, every level in the game would be designed to accommodate each and every one of them ability-wise. So basically, Mila has her own original level in her own playthrough. And that begs the question, why does she not have a adventure mode available for her? Because she clearly has her own side of the story to tell, because otherwise you'd think that she just get forced into the story, but she does not have any personal stake in the story otherwise. Yeah. She's just there to play the cute mascot, but she doesn't really have a point in the story as a whole. Now, she gets captured at some point, but that's spoiler territory. Yeah. But that doesn't really contribute anything to the story or the narrative as a whole. She's just, you know, along for the ride for no adequately explained reason. In theory, yeah. you would be able to see the complete story of Freedom Planet by playing both as Lilac and Carol in the adventure mode. Nope. <laughs> Nope, because it still feels like there are some cutscenes missing and some events that are not being covered. It, yeah, it, feels, it feels like it. Since we're, he it since we're here, I'm going to say it right here, actually. There are certain things that still are unresolved in the story, technically. They're, they're not big details, but they're so small that it will bug you for a while. Uh, they are no small details at all. I mean, whatever happens to... Prince Dale, does he ever break out of the brainwashing? Yeah, that's a bit, that's the one of them I was a bit unsure. I mean, after he gets defeated once and for all, we never see or hear anything from him ever again. Isn't he supposed to be the regent ruler of uh, Shui Tang, of his own city? Yeah. It would be nice to have an explanation. It would be also nice to expand a little bit on the backstory of both Lilac and Carol, because we understand they come from a troubled time from a, from a band of martial artist ninja thieves and assassins something like that, and assassins or something like that which is apparently commanded by prince dale's brother we don't get to expand on any of this character's background why is prince dale's younger brother the leader of a freaking uh, gang of thieves there are some important plot points missing in this game and I am complaining about this because clearly this story went above and beyond to have an actual story to have a fully developed narrative delivered via cutscenes to give context to the levels so the thing is either you fully develop a story covering all the plot holes that you left or you don't do a story at all from my research on this I heard Mila will get a story at some point but I have no idea if that's going to be, or because there's no release date, but but uh, I'm hoping that'll be the case, that she'll get her own story she soon, needs, she, because she, she needs, really needs it. She needs to have context, she needs a context for being in this story to begin with, because and also her powers needs to have some sort of context, because if you think about it, all that we know about her is that she hasn't seen her parents in a long time. What was she doing? Was she lost? Was she living in the forest? What's her deal? Yeah. So like I said, that and other little things like uh, 
Dale and like, like Dale and, and the spoiler his, spoilers areas. Like Dale and his brother Spade. Spade being the leader of the thieving gang that the main characters used to be part of. They are just left there on the ether without any resolution or any expanded backstory. So that's a bit uh, disappointing. Yeah, it disappointed me as well because I really wanted to know because I was really well, invested well, in the story. Well, I'm going to be honest, I didn't particularly care about Spade. No, <laughs> Spade is but, just the cool guy. <laughs> not really, but it would be nice to expand more on the personal backstories of the two main characters because from what I see in the cutscenes, there is a lot of emotional turmoil implied in the way they both react to their former gang leader and uh, when they get to talk about one's own parents not being around anymore. There is a lot implied in their backstory, but not enough exposed. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, beating the final boss was really cathartic. That's... <laughs> yeah, that was like the best thing ever. But it was the best sensation. Yes, I did it. Ha, take that. I beat you, Lord Braven. I am a hero. I saved the world. Another bit of trivia on this, when that, because I decided to be a complete nerd and look into the game's files, and I actually came across some interesting findings when listening oh? to the voice clips. Oh? There was... I'm not going to say what the scene is, but uh, there's two cutscenes. One of them is still in the game, but is silent because they were they were voice acted at one point, but they replaced it with just letting the scene tell you what it is. That I think that was a smart decision. Yes, it's a smart decision in general. You know, show don't tell. Yes, that I think that was a better choice as well. It also uh, didn't uh, you know take too long to know what's going on. But uh, the other one is completely missing a cutscene too. Basically, it's uh, some voice lines that seem to uh, imply that Carol did something to uh, help Lilac, and let's put it this way, it ends with Carol falling and screaming by the sounds of it. Like some Ooh. sort of sacrificial thing to help the hero get to somewhere. Ooh. Yeah, very interesting stuff. But you know, I really hope this game has a sequel. I hope it becomes a franchise, in fact. Yes, to be honest. I, wa I, want, I want people to buy this game. I want people to play this game because it's a really good game. It's one of the best action platformers of the past decade, if you ask me. It's really fun and it's a complete experience. It has its flaws, but the enjoyable factor far outweighs the flaws that we just mentioned. Yes, I agree with that statement just because I really had more fun with this game than I had with anything in a long while. I became so obsessed with this game, I made it as my sole excuse to not work on editing Discworld. You just wanted an excuse not to edit those last <laughs> couple of hours of oh, gameplay. Oh, if, if I didn't have Freedom Planet, I probably would've just went and did the work, but nope, I've decided I was so obsessed with Freedom Planet and researching it that I... Well, it is a game that demands your full attention, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, it's a... Oh, by the way, we haven't actually talked about how the game looks. Yes, the... I'm gonna say this, the game is gorgeous. Fantastic pixel art evocative of the olden days of your gaming yore. <laughs> it has its own feeling, and uh, the, the sprite characters are really emotionally expressive. That's very fluid, the animation. Oh, yes. Uh, and about the emotional part. It helps that yeah. the game story eventually gets really dark. Yes, it N definitely... Need I, need I remind you the torture scene? <laughs> yeah. That was very uncomfortable. <laughs> that was, that was like, that was like, that, that was like, reminded me so much of, uh, you know, me as a kid watching my favorite Saturday morning cartoon and then suddenly got dark for like five minutes. <laughs> What would it be, Sonic's at AM? <laughs> I don't know, but I I know there's a, quite a few Saturday morning cartoons that did that 
A couple. Yes. Uh, but well, well. To be fair, that was a the nineties was a transitional period in between the silliness of Transformers and the seriousness of to, Batman animated series. To be, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if Freedom Planet's story was a homage to those sort of cartoons with how the honestly, dialogue is delivered. Honestly, Freedom Planet feels like the unofficial spiritual successor to that Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon from the early 90s. <laughs> the good one, yeah. that is, in tone and characters and, and storyline. Though, mind you, now that I think about it, uh, graphically speaking, uh, not graphically, more like I had a glitchy moment at one point in Freedom Planet where, uh, you know the, the part where there's a pairing blocks and you have to get through them as soon as you can? Yes? Well, I jumped at one point and one of the blocks appeared, which should have crushed me up to the ceiling. Instead, it pushed me up to the next floor above. Well, that's interesting. Yes. Also very, also very lucky. Yes, extremely. I was like thinking, what the... <laughs> Speaking of nice things, the did music. You know yes, the soundtrack is fantastic. It gets stuck in, in your head forever, for days on end, especially the main theme. Yeah, the main theme, the major boss fights, the. Yes. Uh, and for some reason, the first part of the Dreadnought was like one of the most awesomest intros to the final the area dread of the game. The final Dreadnought was harsh. It was really harsh. And, and the music on part one was a great example of You know what they really you know intense. what they really like? The thermal bass level. At some point we meet with GLaDOS. Oh basically. yeah. Syntax <laughs> putting on her best GLaDOS impression. Yeah, so pre pre pretty much we we're faced with the artificial intelligence uh, taking hold of the place, sending obstacles to us. And she was basically GLaDOS. <laughs> she was basically GLaDOS, and it was fantastic. You have they, to see it for yourself, folks. You, because have you have GLaDOS in your Sonic the Hedgehog-inspired video game. You have to see this for yourself, folks, because yes. it's so it's so amusing and yet <laughs> and yet fun at the same time to see a computer with personality like that. Speaking of amusing, yeah, uh, the Magister guy. Oh yeah, the Magister. The Magister, the one with the really deep voice. Yeah. He was actually voiced by our good friend, Edwin, Edwin Tiong. The Detective Grimoire Tiong. I actually recognized him. <laughs> yes, it's definitely... Oh, he also voiced the Dragon Scientist, but that's spoiler, 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 spoiler territory, so yeah. enough with that. So, in conclusion, let's conclude this. Okay, but one more thing, though, because uh, I just want to say about one detail, which I really liked. Uh, the final level with, you know, with the, when you enter the Dreadnought, Brevin actually has presence there. He's not sitting around doing nothing. I know! You can hear him in the intercoms basically mocking you and... Telling and his <laughs> troops to get you. Yes, that, that's great! That was genius to integrate your villain into the level so it doesn't make it look like as if he's just sitting there waiting for you to come get him. Indeed. That's also a thing with many of the bosses throughout this game. Sometimes you face them as mid-bosses, and sometimes they come back as actual bosses. Like the character of Serpentine. Oh, most enjoyable minion ever. <laughs> I kind of... I was kind of annoyed by him. <laughs> is it because his voice, or is it because the way he attacks? Oh, his attack pattern is really annoying, that's, that's for <laughs> sure. But honestly, I have to say... Yeah. Okay, fighting Serpentine in his uh, giant uh, panther, in his giant panther-like robot at the end of the China-inspired setting. Yeah, Fortune Knights. Fortune Knights. As Carol riding her motorcycle may be the coolest boss battle in the entire game. Oh yeah, that's the thing with these. Because okay, here's the thing. Okay, once okay, here's the thing. Once Carol is on her motorcycle, she can do all manner of omnidirectional aerial attacks. We forgot to mention that. And the best part thing you could possibly do with that motorcycle is having her do a double jump, which turns into a spin attack, immediately followed by her Chun Li style kick while she's aerial on her motorcycle. That is just badass. That is the most. <laughs> Yes, that is plain that's, badass. That's actually two things I want to say about boss fights. 
each boss fight actually feels different. I mean, you're doing the same thing, but because of the way the game uh, executes these boss fights, they each all have their own feel and scenario uh, in how you take them on. Oh, what was I thinking now? It's like, I was so into this, and then I forgot the other half of the conversation. Each, Each boss, boss has, a... Has, a, has a unique pattern and a yeah. unique feel, um, and you have to basically change your strategy for every time you face them. Yes. That's with a, a different character, too. But yeah, the boss fights, in short, are pretty damn awesome. Alright, so, that was our review of Freedom Planet. We liked it. I, we think it's the best Sonic game ever made. Uh, I, wouldn't say, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say. I would say it is Sonic inspired, but okay. It's okay. Here's the thing. It's a far better game than any of the actual Sonic games, and it actually is a fun platformer for once. It is a fun, fully developed action platformer with tons of uh, variety in its approach to each level and and the gameplay capabilities of each individual characters. It has a solid, a really solid level design to accommodate set characters and their specific gameplay styles. It has a few flaws, particularly concerning the way characters that are not lilac are developed. <laughs> but it's definitely an enjoyable experience and we wholly recommend it. This uh, game needs support because we want to see sequels of it. Yes, I want to see a sequel to this. God damn it. I, I want to see Lord Braven coming back because he's obviously going to come back. Sequel bait. Yeah, you know, sequel bait he's everywhere. Coming, he's going to come back and, and swear his revenge to the to the planet of freedoms. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, but yeah, I would love to see this game continue because they built the foundation. I would like to see more of this world. I, I would want like to see, see the, more want, yes. of the characters' backstory. I want to see, yes, I want to see the world of Abalis expanded upon. Also, each individual character's backstory expanded upon. It would be nice, too. And also, well, do something about Carol's color scheme. Because, <laughs> I don't know, dark green is kind of unpleasant. I understand it's the color that wild cats usually do. If they're thinking of the, the almost extinct breed of cats you find in Japan... I think that's the inspiration for Carol specifically, but still, uh, that color does not look good with most of the backgrounds in the game. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining us, everybody. This has been Madog Day Master, and I've been Devarakvron, and we have been reviewing Freedom Planet. Go buy this game now. Buy this game. Get us more sequels. Donate to them if you have to. <laughs> yes, give them all your money. This game is fantastic and you're going to love it. It's hard as balls of steel, but it'll be worth it at the end. So, so, so yeah, thanks everyone. And, and take care of yourselves. Good night, everybody. Good night. Oh yeah, 20% cooler, 10 seconds flat. Rum, 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 I got a motorcycle. <laughs>